much everyone for coming out. We're going to get things started. Wait a minute, I'm sorry. I have to hug my second cousin. Oh. I have more? Yes. <laughs> so at least I have the chance of convincing three people here to talk. This morning. I like this. Oh, sorry. That was, wasn't planned. I wish I could be that good. Hi there, so I'm Jim Throgmorton from the mayor of Iowa City, some of you know that. Uh, I, I need to say something right to start to be clear. I hold a non-partisan position. I did not run as a Democrat, I did not run as a Republican. Therefore, I'm not here to endorse the governor. I'm not here to endorse any particular candidate oh, mayor. or anybody. <laughs> 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 uh, but I am here to welcome the governor. I'm really excited that you're here. I'll just Thank you, Mayor. Welcome back to the city. We love you here. Thank you. I'm going to say just a couple other words about Montana, a state that I truly love. I have a certain kind of history that goes back to the mid 1960s when I worked at, that's right, Glacier National Park, a place that I really love. That's a strong place in my heart. But I have a history of Iowa City. Montana goes deeper. I have uh, my mother's grandfather died in Anaconda, near Anaconda. He was a copper miner. And he died in 1896. Yeah. I've never met him, never knew anything about him. It's been really hard to discover everything. But that's where he died. And he lived a very hard life during the mine of Anaconda. Yeah. So lots of people have been in this it's a wonderful state. If you haven't had a chance to go out here, please do. One other thing, he's got a reputation that to do with dark money. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. That matters because we've got to make sure that we have control over our elections, not somebody. Governor, welcome back. Thanks so much, Mayor. Yeah. coming out today. And you know, I know that, and it's a gift to I'm traveling with Attorney General Tom Miller. Hey, Tom! I hope you know what you have with Tom. You know, I was a Deputy Attorney General uh, before I became Attorney General. I'll never forget the first time I met uh, your Attorney General. And kind of in this calm way he goes, I'm Tom Miller. And I'm like, you're the Tom Miller? <laughs> For me, it was like meeting Bono. Yeah, it really was. It, and look, I get that about this time that you have people that come to visit you and they try to make all kinds of attenuated connections to Iowa. So I'm not even going to mention that my great great grandpa settled in Henry County in 1850, or my mother was born in Wolf, or in Ottawa, actually. Oh. The family store through the two world wars was in Lowell. Because that's not why we're here. <laughs> right, cousin? That's not why we're here. No, we're here for the sake of our country and for the sake of our country standing in the world. Yeah. And for the sake of the America that we're going to pass on to that next generation. We're here to make sure that Donald Trump's a one term president. Yeah. Yeah. More than that. We're also here to soundly reject the behavior that he's normalized. Yeah. Yeah. He's lied, he's mistaken, he's divided us by race, by gender, by geography, the Twitter tirades, the temper tantrums. Yeah. We now expect more out of our preschoolers yeah. than we do the President of the United States. And as I'm traveling, folks actually want more than just that. You know, people are working harder and making less money. In 40 years, over the last 40 years, about 60% of Americans are actually making less than they did when adjusted in real terms. Or you're from a larger town, relatively, but our small towns, two-thirds of the counties have lost businesses in the last decade. You shouldn't have to leave your church or your community or your school just to have a decent job. If you're a parent or a grandparent, when I was growing up in the 70s, 90% of 30-year-olds are doing better than the parents were at age 30. Today it's half. So folks turn around, the economy's not working, they look for this political system for relief. And it's captured now by, in this post-Citizens United world, which I'll talk a little bit more about, about dark money. 
2% of the groups before Citizens United outside spending didn't disclose their donors. This last election was over half. Or you see, literally, tax cuts being written because that's what the wealthy donors ask for. Or environmental regulations being gutted because that's what the polluters request. There's no wonder in some respects that folks are frustrated and they're anxious, at times they're angry, but instead of doing something about it, this president's poured gasoline on the fire. We are more divided today than any time in my lifetime. And forget about Twitter or cable television. You can't even have conversations around a Thanksgiving dinner or an often in a tap room without politics dividing us. He is dividing us in our communities and our country. And that's not the promise of America. We are better than that. Look, I was raised from grade school through high school, single parent household, uh, paycheck to paycheck. Only knew that there was a governor's house in town because I delivered newspapers to it as a kid. So I've made it four blocks in life, literally. <laughs> but I worked my way through college. I borrowed my way through law school. I'll never forget that day that my wife and I paid off what would be $175,000 of loans in today's terms. But even with that, I had a chance from delivering newspapers to governor's house as a kid to raise my three kids in. we got to acknowledge that for a whole lot of people in this country, that chance no longer exists. For a whole lot of folks in this country, that fair shot never happens. So yeah, we got to be Donald Trump, but we got to make sure that our economy and this political system actually works for folks. I believe it can be done, but I think we also have to be clear on it. Because not every town in America is like Iowa City. Meaning that if we don't change our strategy, if we don't win back some of the places that we lost last time, if we can't give people a reason to vote for us, not just against him, we've got to be clear on that Donald Trump sure can win again. And I believe we can because I've seen it. In 2016, I was the only Democrat in the country to get reelected statewide in a state where Trump won. Donald Trump took Montana by 20 points. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. And a lesson in there that we can't write off places just because we lost last time. I don't have the luxury in going around in the fourth largest state in the country and just saying, I'm going to look for the Iowa cities of the world, right? <laughs> Not just chasing pockets of blue. I actually have to go out and engage with folks all along. And that's what we need to be doing to make sure that we can win. And look, I get that I'm the 37th candidate in this race or something like that. You know, when I first got in, I'll, so I announced in, uh, in my high school classroom that I went to and that my daughter's in, uh, then actually did day of press and came to Des Moines. And first I'm walking in and somebody goes, it's so great, but what took you so long? <laughs> and fact of the matter is I had a job to do. My legislature, which is actually a little bit more Republican than yours is not, um, was still meeting at the time. And I had to do things like save health care for 10% of our population, get Medicaid expansion reauthorized. So I certainly wasn't the first in. Um, I will be on the debate stage in July. The yeah. And I do believe also in this greatly divided time, the government can work. So I said, my legislature is 60% Republican. And even with that, yeah, we've been able to expand health care to 100,000 Montanans. Yeah, we passed one of the most progressive and aggressive laws to kick dark money out of our elections. Yeah, we've made record investments in our K-12 system. We froze college tuition. We have the fourth lowest tuition fees in the nation because of the investments we're making at the state level, unlike, candidly, what's happening in Iowa. But we haven't also made it all about just those that are going to college. We've made seven of my ten community colleges, five of my seven tribal colleges, not even about a degree, but about a freshly recognized certificate or apprenticeship, so people can actually make a decent living learning some skills. As a result, folks are climbing into the middle class of Montana at a higher rate than any other state in the country. But they will do that by certainly, I look for common ground, but that doesn't mean to compromise the values that we all hold. I also have more vetoes than any governor in the history of Montana. <laughs> I have stopped every single attack on a woman's right to make her own health care decisions. Because those are my <laughs> 25 
states in this last two years actually made it harder to vote, disenfranchising people. We preserved access to the ballot box. We've also preserved access for injured workers to the courthouse. I've kept our public lands in public hands. And certainly <laughs> rolled back any efforts to turn around and cut renewable portfolio standards in areas like that. And as a former union side labor lawyer, I've protected every single time the right to organize and collectively bargain. <laughs> and how I win and how I govern are much the same. I'll never forget when we were trying to get uh, Medicaid expansion passed. It was 2015. This was the heart of the anti-Obamacare time. Went to a town called Shoto, Montana. Shoto's a town about 1,700 folks along the Rocky Mountain front. And I show up in town, and literally everybody knew why I was coming, because the Koch brothers were so kind to mail everyone these postcards that have Barack Obama and Steve Bullock right next to one another, saying, Bullock's come to your community to destroy your health care system. But I showed up, and instead of just telling them what they needed, I listened. First person that spoke in that town hall was uh, the hospital administrator. He said, you know what, 43% of the people who walk through these doors don't have health insurance. A couple of folks got up afterwards and called me a communist or something like that. Or, but then there's probably the fourth or fifth speaker who was a rancher. He was the chair of our county commission, your county supervisors. Didn't even live in Shoto. He was uh, from Bynum, population 50. Call that kind of a suburb. <laughs> but he got up and he goes, you know what? I was born in this hospital. This hospital saved my life two years ago when I had a heart attack. And if we lose this hospital, this town's gone. So not by me telling them what they need, not by me making about politics, but by me actually listening. That's what gave that Republican legislator the courage to defy the Koch brothers, defy the party leadership, and pass it. So we went from 20% uninsured to 7% today. Even throughout Iowa, because of your privatization of your Medicaid, your rural hospitals are at risk. We haven't lost one rural hospital. That's how government ought to work. And I do fundamentally believe that D.C. could learn a bit from Montana. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, and I know some people say, oh, Montana, it's just a small state. A little bit bigger population than states like Delaware or Vermont. I'm just saying. Just saying. But I think also, if we're not willing to address the thing that's holding Washington, D.C. back in so many different ways, and that really is the toxic influence of money in our system, we're not going to get anything else done that so many folks are talking about through this election. Think about this. Lindsey Graham literally said, we got to get the Trump tax cut through to make our donors happy. Same time that 44% of Americans would have 400 bucks in their pocket if their car broke down or they had a medical emergency. We've replaced an entire generation of workers with independent contractors. Same time union membership is half of what it was in 1980. Drug companies are willing to invest pretty darn big in our elections. We pay more for prescription drugs and health care than any other country in the world. We've got nothing to show for it. Or you know what? Oil companies are making some record profits. Like Chevron didn't even pay taxes last year. Not a nickel in taxes. And Republicans can't even acknowledge that climate change is impacted by humans. So until we're willing to address that piece of it, it's going to be that much harder to get any of this stuff done. I believe we can do it because I've seen it done before. I was Attorney General uh, along with General Miller and others when this case called Citizens United came up. Little case that all of a sudden said corporations have the same rights as people. And my speech. If you remember when that case came down, every state in the country said game over and there's nothing that we can do. <laughs> Actually we control both houses of Congress and the President the time. People gave speeches about it, they talked about it, they raised money off of it, but they didn't do anything. Montana had a unique history, and I didn't know before today it's actually connected to Iowa City, because where your mom's grandpa died in these mines in Anaconda, Montana, we once had this area, and it was called the Copper Kings. Wealthy copper miners that literally controlled every single level of local, state, and federal elections 
A newspaper in 1906 said the greatest living issue confronting us today is whether the corporations shall control the people or the people shall control the corporations. And this got notoriety beyond Montana. One of these guys' names was William Clark, and Mark Twain talked about him. Twain said, you know, Clark buys politicians like most people buy food. By his example, corruption actually smells really sweet. But as regular Montanans said, enough's enough. They passed this, it was called the Corrupt Practices Act. And it said the corporations couldn't spend or contribute to influence our elections. So as a result, elections became about people talking to people, not about how much money you raise. We also had the lowest contribution limits among it in the country. So that act had served Montana well for 100 years. So when Citizens United came up, I said, I can't just give up. It was AG actually put together a case got testimony from Republicans about what just the threat of this spending could do to our elections. First case up after Citizens United. A lot of interest. Lost on a 5-4 decision. 100 years of Montana history. Taught me two things. One of which don't ever doubt what one Supreme Court justice can do when it comes to our democracy, when it comes to workers' rights, when it comes to women's rights, when it comes to what we can actually have as a country. But also taught me that I couldn't give up and doubled down. At the time, my legislature was about two thirds Republican. I worked with them to pass this law that said 90 days out from an election, I don't care who you are or what you are, if you call yourself Americans for America for America, you have to disclose every dollar you spend on elections. Remember running uh, for re election in 2016, and uh, 91 days out, Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers, were nice enough to put in, you know, this mailings that hit just about every household in Montana. And even my kids looked at it and said, boy, Dad, I don't know about it. <laughs> but on day 90, it stopped. If we can stop the Koch brothers in Montana, we sure ought to be able to do it in Iowa and Washington and everywhere else across this country. Yeah. Look, this is the most important election in my lifetime. It is about beating Donald Trump, but it's also about preserving this 243-year experiment called Representative Democracy. Because it is getting shaken now, and the foundation of it really is. It's about making sure that not only can we win in D.C., but we can win in Iowa. A little secret that I don't know if other candidates have told you. We'll be hanging out here for about the next 210 days. <laughs> then we leave! <laughs> You know what, you have a 30 year counties in this state that went Obama, Obama, Trump. So it's also about making sure that we have somebody at the top of the ticket that can help you take back your state house and take back your governor's race two years later. Because when you look at what's happened to health care, education funding, the rights of women, across the board, workers' rights to organize collectively bargain in Iowa. Yeah, it's important who's in D.C., but it's also important who's in Des Moines. I, yes. And I do think I can add something to that that a whole lot of this big bill can't. I'm an optimist. I got three young kids. You got to be optimistic, right? <laughs> but more than that, I think that that's kind of core to who we are as Americans. And we know we're actually at our better, best when all voices can be heard, not when we divide into these warring camps or when civility can actually replace anger, or that everybody, no matter who their parents were, has that fair shot at the better, sort of that American dream of doing better than your parents or your grandparents did. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm so excited about it. And that's why I would be remiss if I learned along the way that I know we still have 205 days left, and I know that one of the, you all take this very, very seriously. And I also love the Iowa Nice where I talk to somebody and go, yeah, you're on my list. And I'm like, well, Al makes your list. <laughs> but I ask you to take a close look. Because I can't do this without your help. So I ask you to dig into this. To look at both what I've done and what I can do. Because I think I can add a heck of a lot to that. With that, thank you. I'll answer almost any question. <laughs> with the Israelis now, or I should
should say, uh, Jared Kushner now wanting to just throw money at the Israeli peace conflict. Um, we know that part of the problem, the reason that uh, Palestine can't grow economically is because of the of the Israeli occupation. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's something that a Bullock administration would do that could help free the Palestinians no. make sure they have equal rights no. to Israelis. Yeah, and what we really need to do is get back to a two-state solution. And we can't do that alone. I don't see how that's possible well, anymore. Most of us don't. Well, I can only hope because what this like this administration hasn't helped this out at all along the way. And that's what I think, maybe not the leadership in Israel, but I think that's what folks in Israel and Palestine really look to seek along. So I can't give up on that idea. And I don't think the international community can give up on that. I've had the chance to, you know, it's pretty amazing when you go through Jerusalem and what you're seeing along the way. Yeah, I'd also say it was interesting because shortly after I got into this, um, you know, I was actually at the Chicago airport and I'd just been on Rachel Maddow and somebody said, oh, you're that governor of Montana. <laughs> and, and, and he was a rabbi from uh, outside of Chicago. And so I asked him, like, what do you do if all of a sudden you're no longer the head you know, of your synagogue when you run for president? Now his advice to me, I thought, was pretty searing in some respects. He goes, uh, no, I do think that we have to continue to fight for a two-state two solution. But what even concerns me more today is that I have to have police officers outside my synagogue. And the level of division that we're seeing in so many respects. The problem is that the, the, the Israelis have such control over Palestinian lives that they can't even move from one place to another oh, yeah. in their own territory. Yeah. And it's just, you know, what most of us are looking at these days. And I mean by Some of you. Many, okay. Many of us are looking at today, these days, is that uh, Palestinians don't have freedom of movement. All we're looking for are equal rights between Israelis and Palestinians. I don't care whether it's one state, two state, whichever way you're looking yeah. at it. But just as long as we have equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians. Palestinians are living under Israeli control with a total different law section. And that's the, that's the definition of apartheid. And, so. and I do think it does. I mean, I personally think we have to be fighting for two states. Yes, sir. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace. We're in the process in Congress of approving a $750 billion military budget for fiscal year 2020. Uh, at the same time, the budget for Center for Disease Control is about $6 billion. The increase in the military budget is five times the total budget of CDC. So I have two short questions. Would you as president see a need and a rationale for reining in military spending and our military activities overseas. But the second question is, um, in your campaign, would there not be uh, a political pragmatic advantage for you to talk about that? Because this ranges from, this is not a conservative thing or a liberal thing, yeah. It's not a uh, Trump versus Obama thing. It is common sense. I, so what's your opinion? No, I, I, the other thing I love about Iowa City is they say, this is the answer, what's your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> no, but look, I have, I've been to Afghanistan. I've been to Kuwait as Commander Chief of the National Guard. I've sent people on their fourth and fifth deployments and welcomed them home. And you think about someone joining the National Guard today at age 18 has never known a time where we haven't been in conflict. Now there is one piece of this looking backwards. Every time that we've been in previous conflicts, we actually said we either got to suck it up by increasing taxes or doing things to pay for it. But that's not what happened under, certainly when Bush started the first piece of this. 
I do think that we have to be very, very careful in our military spending, and we should be questioning how we're spending the money. I look at the overall values, number one is to protect American people, two, and the next president's going to have a lot to do in this, is strengthening these alliances, because this world post-World War II order, where our friends expected and counted on us, both in trade and in military policy, has changed substantially. To redeter our adversaries, you've got to do that with dialogue as well. And fourth, promote sort of the values of American human rights and democracy. That doesn't mean we should be in any or every single sort of conflict in this world. But we also have an obligation, I think, that extends beyond just the U.S. as the global peace. So I do think that we need to do greater scrutiny and also recognize that the threats of yesterday are not necessarily the threats of today. Meaning that some of the investments in equipment, well, we should be making those investments now in cyber and others because the attacks are changing quite a bit along the way. Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would guess offhand that a good substantial majority of people here right now would say if asked that you are, as we used to say, right on the issues. And that's a very good start. But then the question is, how do you bring it into reality? You've been at Stepco. You're familiar with Washington. You know how it works and doesn't work and why. Yeah. Now you've got a, a Republican-controlled Senate. Yeah. So how are you going to do all these wonderful things in Des Moines that you've been able to do in Montana? What well, I'm not running for governor here in Iowa. <laughs> what you were able to do in, in Montana with the enormous power. I mean, it's not just the Gold Brothers, as if that wasn't bad enough, but it's every one of these major industries. Yeah. So, it, 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 the military has more lobbyists than there are members of the House and Senate. I mean, you're familiar with all that. Yeah. Okay, so, so yep. why are you I'm, going I'm why are you. you going to be more successful? Yeah. And, and bringing this wonderful platform of ideals yep. Yep. to existence than anybody else. Than any of the yeah. other, what you described yeah. as like, 37. Like, look, and in part, I'd say because out of this field of 37, there's only one that's actually done it. And I've done it my whole time with the Republican legislature. I've shown that you can bridge some of these divides. I begin with this base premise that, to be honest, even if it's a presidential candidate, most folks in this great country they don't have time to come even listen to them, or time to engage in politics. The word is, my kid going to get sick? Am I going to lose my job? But the values that most people have, right? I begin with this basic premise that the values you want is a safe community, a roof over your head, a decent job, clean air and clean water, good public schools, that belief you can do generationally better. That's how I've organized in Montana from those values perspectives. I think one thing you can do, even without changing Congress when it comes to money in our elections. And I'm the only state that did it. I said, under Citizens United, I can't tell you that you can't spend corporations, but if you want a contract with the state of Montana, I want you to disclose every single dollar that you're paying or contributing to influence our elections. <coughs> Think about if the federal government did that on day one. The contract with dang near every business in America. At least you'd add sunshine and transparency. And I told it, and executive I executive order and administration. Yeah, yeah, you can do that by executive order. Regulation. Yep. And, and then I'll tell you one other piece too. Like I told this story of Shoto. But I could have told you probably 20 Shotos around the state. Like when I was getting Medicaid expansion through, I went to all kinds of what would be hostile territory, the places that had rural hospitals that had to stay open. If I was president, yeah, I would work to build relationships with those on the other side of the aisle. But you don't just make your case there. The next president should spend as much time in Kentucky as he or she does in Washington, D.C. And I'd also, I think the rules are now written in D.C. for the status quo for nothing to happen. 
So I would be one that turned around and said, this filibuster rule we should get rid of because then every individual senator, no matter what that spread is, has more of an interest in actually voting the interests of their constituents than they do necessarily just their party. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, thank you. My name is Max. I'm an ACLU. Take yourself. Right you got both. That's a good vote. Hi now. And my name is Max. I'm an ACLU Rights for All voter. Hi, Max. Hi. Um, and I believe we need to face the crisis of mass incarceration that hurts so many millions of people, especially people in minority communities. <laughs> You're going to give me an exact number, right? By 50%. <laughs> yeah. During the presidency. Yeah. Let me tell you a couple of things. That, you know, and I haven't because I haven't looked at, so how do you get that exact number? Let me tell you both what, some of what I've done and I think what we need. Oh. Like even in that highly Republican legislature, we passed about 10 different bills to turn around and do comprehensive criminal justice reform. Looking at the inside, or the front side, first of all, of saying, there ought to be sentencing based on actually crime and threat. Looking at, like we got rid of, we used to take your driver's license away if you hadn't paid a fine. Well, how are you ever going to actually work to pay that fine if you can't even drive? Looking at re-entry opportunities at every step of how you can actually, when somebody is done with their time of service, be productive citizens and not get them into a cycle. And we know that, as an example, marijuana use. Whites and blacks, there's no real disparity in use, but you're 4x more likely to end up in jail if you're African American. So I do think that we do need to work to reduce those overall numbers. I can't give you that exact number uh, today, but I think that we've got to look at this criminal justice system ain't working as it ought to be, and we do have much more mass incarceration than Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yes, sir. I'd like to know, perhaps all of us would like to know, how you will beat Trump. Or is he vulnerable? Can you work on his third of the population that still likes him? Well, yeah, and look, I am not so naive to say that, like, we will all grab hands and sing, We Are the World, and, like, skip to the buttercup fields, right? And, yeah, there's a chunk of the voters that there's no way that you will ever get them to move away from him. And I think in part that's what we've seen with the Republican Party that's so afraid of that chunk of voters. I say it's 35%. So that they're not even willing to stand up and talk about the values that the Republicans used to have. But I think there's a whole lot more folks that, look, if we can't win back Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, if you can't win back some of the counties that you lost in Iowa for your state house, I think there are a lot of folks out there, and that's why I say we got to give folks a reason to vote for us, not just against him. Because there are times when Democrats are talking. They're talking about how bad Donald Trump is, and guess what? I agree. What he's doing to America and America's stand in the world isn't good. But there's that transference suggesting something's wrong with folks because they voted for him. And when D.C. wasn't working, somebody said, I'm going to drain the swamp. Look, it's swampier today than it ever was. <laughs> But you can see why, why not blow up the system? Or when you haven't had a pay increase in 40 years. Now, understand the fact that whoever cleans this place tonight will pay more than 50 of the Fortune 500 companies because these Trump tax cuts, or a trillion dollars of stock buybacks sure as heck didn't go to folks like me and you. So I do think you can bring folks back, because if they're voting their economic interests, if they're voting their education interests, if they're voting their health care interests, they ought to be with us. But we also have to be able to show up. And Democrats don't even always show up in many of the places. Spend some time in Rippy. How many of you have been in Rippy? It's a great little like, town of 300, farm town. Right? And it doesn't quite, that was yesterday, it doesn't quite have the voter demographics as Iowa City. But if we're not there, I'll also talk to those farmers. And when that registered Republican farmer said, you know what, every time this president tweets, I lose money, and we ought to be able to do better. <laughs> if we're not willing to engage and give folks that reason, we're not going to win. I think I can do it, A, because I've done it before, and B, there's another piece of this that I think we all have to think about. This is more than cobbling together 270 electoral votes. Because if there are parts of this country, 
and big parts off the coast that feel like, well, these guys don't care about me. Even if we win, we're not going to be able to go. I think I can do that, and that's why I'm doing this whole deal. Yeah, Governor, thank you. Governor, one, one question left? Yes, sir. Um, with all, and I'll be around for one more time. With all due respect to our stable genius, uh, I find it heartbreaking what's happening with the Southern border. Comment, if you would, on the balance between humanity no. and security of the day. No, and I find it heartbreaking too, and this is a humanitarian crisis. And it's a humanitarian crisis, largely of this administration's doing. No family should be ripped apart and kids put in cages. Democrats believe in border security, but they don't believe in ripping families apart. They don't believe in what's happening. If you look at these three Central American countries, in the last six years, five years, the appropriated aid to those countries have gone down two-thirds. So at the same time that we're saying, I can't believe that you're showing up at the border, we're also cutting any aid to the Central American countries. And you have, a, candidly, a bureaucratic mess. You have 400 judges for 780,000 asylum cases. So I think we need comprehensive immigration. I mean, if you looked at, there were about 3 million people that knew no other country than ours, the dreamers, that had protections until June of 2000, or January of 2017 when this president changed that. If you look at the policies of family separation, this president changed that. Two-thirds of the folks that live in this country without documentation, undocumented immigrants, have been here for over 10 years. So this president is trying to cynically, I think, use immigration to divide us at the same time that he's causing essentially human rights abuses. Anybody that shows up at the border should be certainly checked, see if the asylum claim is valid, and should be treated just like we treat one another. And I think that we need to get to comprehensive immigration reform. Interesting in that same town, Rippy, that I was talking about. One of these farmers talked about, you know what, I can't find people here to work. So I went through an H-2A visa program, and I had eight folks from Belize on it. Paid them $13, $15 an hour, gave them a house, paid for the trip. Now this administration is saying, I can't even get these folks back along the way. So he's completely exacerbated the problem so much. I think that if you look, rewind a little bit, when you have the Gang of Eight actually saying there's a comprehensive package, we can do that. Do you want to close? So, just wrap it up to my will answer your questions. I'll be around for a while. Well, I, uh, this is also a question for the Attorney General and our former mayor, or our soon to be former mayor. Uh, my name is Dennis Doder. Uh, I would, what is your understanding of the gig economy, and do you have any policy for it? And I can help you out if you have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to answer this real quick then. Tom was just, our Attorney General was going to say a couple of words. The gig economy right now is from the perspective of what you have is you have two times as many workers working in the quote unquote gig economy as you have union members. And that includes public unions. You have actually turned around and de incentivized investing in workers along the way. You have a time where, I'll tell you, benefits. All of a sudden, a whole lot of folks are working real hard and can't get base benefits. So on the one hand, some people say the gig economy is flexibility. But every corporation, like look, now under even these tax cuts, a company can write off a piece of business equipment in the first year. The robot that they buy. But we're not incenting actually investing in workers. Every single company should have to say, here are and disclose, here are my long-term investments and workers. So I think the gig economy, look, part of it is going to continue, as it is, but part of it has happened because we haven't been incenting businesses and others to do what the social contract used to be. Like when my mom got that job at Mountain Bell, 
she knew that she would have a path going forward. They would invest in her training and she'd have a retirement. And that, so much of that's changed. We can talk about the rest of the bill. And your, and your policy towards it would be? Well, and we can, look, we can talk about, we can need we talk to talk <laughs> afterwards? Yeah, no, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I just Thank don't, and I'd love to talk to you. It's a good answer, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> you don't know how to say that. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, let me just turn it over to Tom real quick and then I'll close. Yeah, very good answer. I, I didn't know any much of that at all. Thanks, thanks for educating me as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, I, I want to thank everybody in this room for giving me the chance to be Attorney General. Quite a few times now. Yeah. Yeah. Never would have happened. Never would have happened if it wasn't for support by people like you and, and the vote totals that come out of Johnson County. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, your Longtime county attorney, Pat White, and my friend, Betsy Pat. And finally, I want to tell you why I'm a supporter of, of Steve Bullock's. Um, I've known him for about 12 years. I feel I know him quite well. And here's what I know it's, it's what I call sort of the, the package, or the, the Bullock package causes me to support him. Um, first, he's a man of enormous integrity and character. Uh, he will always do the right thing, even if political pressure or other pressures are the other way. He conducts his personal life in the utmost integrity and, and character. Um, secondly, he's, he's an incredibly able guy, smart, talented. He understands public policy, he understands politics, he understands people, he understands how to, how to, how to put all of them together. Um, third, uh, he has just great judgment. Judgment's an intangible, uh, but an important I, I've seen this with judgment at all different Next, uh, like Nick said, I think he's right on, right on the issues. But my clincher for him is the way he connects with people. Um, you know, of all the people I've seen in Democratic caucuses, which is quite a few now over here, <laughs> he, he connects with people better than anybody except Barack Obama. Um, we talked a little bit about that in terms of being out of the state and connecting with people in rural areas and working class people. That's, that's an enormous asset for this campaign and also also be president. And also, I've got sort of a selfish interest in supporting him and hoping that he's our nominee. That is that I am a proud Iowa Democrat, but I'm also a worried Iowa Democrat. We just, Iowa's been moving in the wrong direction. We need to move it back. And we need someone at the top of the ticket that can help us do that. I firmly believe Steve is that person. In large part because he connects so well. He's the only one that's done this in, the, in, in a state like Montana, in rural places working parts of the neighborhoods. Um, he's the one, and also because he connects, they're, they're, they're connected together. I think he's the strongest that we can have on our ticket so that we can get the legislature right, so that we can win some Senate seats, so that we can protect our three congressional seats, so we win, might even win the Senate race. So I have a, I have a sort of a selfish interest in him being an nominee. Um, you know, I ask you to, to think about this man, think about his qualities, and give him give any consideration if you do choose to support him, I can assure you it'll be a very good campaign. He's got a terrific staff, a lot of organizers now, and he's a candidate that you can always count on. Candidate you can believe in. So if you do support him, I think you'll enjoy it and you'll believe in it. And I believe that we can make a big difference in Iowa and the country. Thanks. Thanks. One last thing, you know, when I got elected uh, governor in 2012, we moved into the governor's residence. My kids at the time were six, eight, and ten. It had been 40 years since kids that age had been part of this whole governor's thing. My 12-year-old son has actually traveled with me on this trip. But, <laughs> but what's his name? We'll call him Cameron because that's his name. <laughs> but, but Cam, yeah. I'll never forget, so we move in and Cam was six. He kicks the soccer ball, bounces off this painting. And yeah, somebody says, oh, that painting's worth 200 or 1,000. And I'm like, well, then let's just get rid of all the damn paintings, right? Because we got to live here. But my first state of the state, and my legislature was deeply divided at that time. I said, you know what, you're going to hear different noises out of the governor's residence and the governor's office with young kids as part of this. 
And I think we as elected leaders got to recognize that kids learn from our words and our deeds, both what we say and how we say it, and what we actually do. And then in 2013, I said, and our kids are watching. I believe that more true today than ever before. And I think we have to be asking ourselves, are we giving something, providing something that the next generation can be inspired by and aspire to? At some point, this president's going to have to answer that question. At some point, every one of us that are running is going to have to answer that question. And I think all of you that are actively engaged will need to answer that as well. I do believe that we can be that more perfect union to provide that. And that's why I did this. That's why I asked for your help along the way. Thanks so much for being here.